to introduce this amazing lady and i've said it multiple times but she is a rock star in dentistry she's one of my favorites out there and whenever i see her she's just uh she's just a, a ray of hope light everything i mean i was at the chicago, chicago midwinter i'm having a conversation outside and this woman comes up and like gives me a big bear hug and i'm like oh my gosh it's the rock star so and she's been everywhere you know it's 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 like um and on the midst, in the midst of it, you run one of the most incredible organizations that changed my life early on. But she also runs a private practice. And her clinical knowledge, behavioral knowledge, I mean, it's just an incredible, you're, you're just an incredible gift to this profession. So when I reached out to you and all this happened, you said, absolutely, I'm in. So um, Lee, you run an incredible organization called the Pecky Institute. And I'm just grateful that you're here. And I guess kind of take it away and we got your back, so. Awesome, thanks Kirk and thanks to everybody else. Um, I've, I've said this a couple of times, thanks for putting this on. I know that these programs every day um, is really helping folks through this, um, giving people something to do and log in and a way to um, come out of this on the other side, stronger, better, smarter. Um, so thank you to you and Act and Dental Intel for, um, for putting all of this on. And we're gonna we're gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, I was listening in for uh, Tal Moore. He's one of my favorites, and so we're gonna go from uh, high end prosthodontic restorations, and we're gonna go to a little bit more bread and butter dentistry. And we are gonna talk about posterior composites. And uh, we're just we're gonna just jump right in here. I'm gonna sharing my screen here. And so let's see if I can do this and you guys don't have to tell me how because I've done Zoom enough that I think I've got this. All right. <laughs> so um, and we're just going to kind of dive right in and I will try to keep um, on the a look on the clock here because um, I probably have more slides than we have time for and we can always pick something back up and do it again later if we don't get done. Um, and I will also attempt to keep my eye on the chat box. So we'll kind of see how we go from there. All right, so I wanted to start out because our topic's gonna be posterior composites. And I'm gonna just talk about some different tips, tricks, techniques that should hopefully help improve the predictability of what, I don't know about most of the people listening, but in my practice is an everyday procedure. I do it. I can't imagine a day that I go in my practice and there's not a posterior composite on the schedule. Um, and some days I have a day that it's just class two after class two. I mean, this is sort of a backbone of my practice in addition to hygiene and just single tooth restorative dentistry. And one of the things that's been on my mind over the last two weeks while I've been um, sitting home thinking about what my practice will look like when I go back is this idea of isolation and controlling aerosols. And so it's relevant both to the times, but it's also relevant to the conversation of posterior composites. And you know, one of the biggest challenges we have when we do adhesive dentistry of any kind, direct or indirect, is um, Managing contaminants, isolation, so water, saliva, red blood cells, all of the contaminants that are automatically in the oral environment, and then some of the ones that we introduce through our handpiece. And they're actually not our friend when it comes to optimum adhesives, and we want to try to manage that. So two really routine isolation techniques that I use in my practice all the time are on the slide. And so Isolite, I think probably everybody um, is aware of Isolite. They make, um, they renamed their company, by the way, it's Xyris Systems now, um, but they still call the product Isolite. 
There's lots of varieties of them. So you can get it with the light, without the light. You can get it with their tubing. You can get it where it just hooks into your high volume. So they've made it pretty quick and simple. Um, I love working with an isolite. My, most of my patients find it actually really comfortable once you get it in and get it in position. And they prefer it over having to um, try to hope they're staying open wide enough for you or worrying about their tongue. Um, it actually really does do a great job at managing um, isolation from a standpoint of moisture in the oral environment, managing aerosols. It is hooked to your high volume. Um, I will be interested in seeing um, after this is over if we see some studies comparing this. Um, but I do know that my good friend Mike Melkers did a study and compared intraoral humidity with a rubber dam in place versus with an isolite in place. Um, and an isolite did really phenomenally well, like better than you might have expected. So it's a really great, uh, great way to isolate and manage things. I can't use it on everybody. And so the other device that you see listed on the picture is called Relief, capital R, little e, capital L-E-A-F. And it comes from a company named Culzer. They're the people who make ivory rubber dam materials. And I use that uh, relief for a couple of different scenarios. One is somebody posted in the chat, what about patients with a really strong gag reflex? Um, this will work much better because you're not putting any pressure or contacting the tongue. And um, it also works really well for um, patients at high functional risk. And so putting people on a bite block or on an isolate, which has a bite block, is actually contraindicated for patients who are at risk of developing TMD, have any previous problems with joints or muscles. And so I'll use the relief. It's actually um, a really great trick. It's imagine it being a dry angle that's connected to a high volume evacuator. And when we think about the high volume, um, and I'm actually gonna stop for a second just because we've had a lot of people in the chat box saying they're having trouble seeing my screen. Um, so I'm gonna just ask Kirk or Mark or somebody to give yep. me a thumbs yeah. up if they can see mine. Okay, Please. all right. Okay, so then I'm going to guess if you're having trouble, it may be internet on your end of the equation, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see if we can keep, that in, uh, keep track of that. So this is a dry angle that's connected to your high volume. So the little leaf is really inexpensive, like under a buck, and they're disposable, and it is really soft. It's a very, very soft material, so super comfortable. And that little plastic piece that you see that looks clear is autoclavable. It connects to an 8-inch piece of tubing that's also autoclavable and you shove it right in the end of your high volume evacuator and so it actually sits in the cheek space unlike when we try to bend a, a saliva ejector and you can never quite figure out the right series of combination of bends to get it to stay where you want um, and it's high volume so it really does a great job at picking up all of the moisture and so that's something that you may want to think about trying by the way if you um, if you get the, the relief, get one, by the way, for your hygiene department as well, because it's probably the best thing that we can think about from a standpoint of using an ultrasonic. And so I'm going to actually stop my share for a second, and then I'm going to share again to see if maybe that solves the problem since the yeah. chat box is blowing up. Um, and so let's see if we can get this so that people can see these slides. All right, share screen, put it back up. All right, and then press play. All right, so we'll see if maybe, you know, this is like when you call about your computer and they say, have you turned it on and turned it back, <laughs> turned it off and turned it back on. Maybe there's some magic in the electrons that'll make this show up, okay? Um, but the other thing I did want to talk about is the concept of a rubber dam. And I know rubber dams are one of these things that most of us were super glad that we were able to leave behind when we left dental school. And then there are other people who say, I do all my dentistry under a rubber dam. I do think that thinking about going back to rubber dam isolation may be on people's radar screen after we get back in our offices simply because of the, ch the fact that it does isolate us from the patient's oral environment and it does prevent uh, aerosols. 
And so whether you go to a traditional rubber dam or I wanted to introduce you to something from Iva Clark called the Optra Dam. And so that's the little blue um, device that you see in the picture on the right hand side of the slide. And that's actually what I call the kinder, gentler version of um, a rubber dam. Why is it the kinder, gentler version? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, everything all comes together, so you don't need to know where the frame is and sterilize it and find the dam material. Um, it also isn't a flat piece of rubber dam, so it literally um, is the shape of the back of the mouth. And because it's not under tension, you don't need a rubber dam clamp. And if you don't use a clamp, you don't need palatal anesthesia on the maxillary and you don't need long buckle anesthesia on the mandibular. It's already got the little holes punched in it. So you literally just punch the holes with your rubber dam punch. And there's a really great video on YouTube of how to put an Optra dam in. It's not intuitive, but if you watch the video in five minutes, you'll know how to put it in. It's just quick, simple, easy way to do a rubber dam might be something people want to explore as they move forward. I will tell you the only caveat is they don't make a latex-free version. So if you're allergic to latex or you have someone um, in your office who's latex allergic or the patient, you can't use an Optradam. They do make traditional rubber dam material in a, um, in a latex-free version. So just some ideas about that. Now, if you're not using a rubber dam or a well inverted rubber dam and you're trying to control saliva and or circular fluid or hemorrhage, a couple of things to think about. And my favorite is to use retraction paste. So I actually don't think retraction paste is the best way to retract and actually get tissue retraction for an impression, but retraction pastes are probably the best hemostatic agents in all of dentistry. And so unlike the liquid hemostatic agents, they don't turn the tissue brown, they don't stain the tooth, um, they don't interfere with any of our other materials. So they're really great at hemostasis, better than the liquids like cranberry styptin or traxodin or any of those. So I actually will tell you my personal favorite is 3Ms. It's got a super fancy name. They call it retraction paste. Um, and I like it because I like the viscosity and also because I can put it in a composite gun. So it makes it really easy from an application perspective. Um, Premier makes a similar product called Traxodent if you like something that the delivery system is more like a flowable syringe. And then Kerr makes something that's called Take One Retraction Paste. They actually brought it out originally as Exposil, um, but now it's called Take One Retraction Paste. You just put these in on the tissue that's bleeding Leave it there for 60 seconds is enough for hemostasis. If you're actually using them for retraction, you need to go three to five minutes to get chemical retraction. And then rinse it and dry it. It will not interfere with your bonding. It will not interfere with any of your adhesive processes. And it'll really help control any gingival hemorrhage that you have in approximately or any circular fluid. So now I wanna talk about something that I will tell you, I did in dental school. So I went to the University of Florida and I can remember when we were first in the clinic and I was first learning how to do interproximal restorations, this was a technique we used. And along with the rubber dam and the face bow and all sorts of stuff, I, um, I left this behind when I graduated from dental school. And then a couple of years ago, I was doing some research on matrix systems for a presentation, and I kept coming across um, studies about this concept called pre-wedging. And I finally decided I probably ought to be curious about this and read some of these studies. So what is pre-wedging? Well, the concept is that you actually put the wedge in first before you start to do the tooth preparation. So give the patient anesthetic and then you're going to push the wedge in. And by the way, if there's anything I need to do about this slide per problem, someone just interrupt uh, me. Brady? Yes. Uh, so there, it, I logged in on my phone. There is something strange going on. Will you stop sharing again one more time and reshare? Absolutely. Oh, so it's, it's for those there that are watching something on their funky phone. going on. Okay, so you tell me what we think I need to do. I was sort of seeing somebody giving ever, us recommendations. Lee, do you ever yeah, do on my laptop, it looks great. And then scroll and then, let's try that. 
see if that helps. You know how you keep the slide viewer on the side and then just Oh, go got to- it. And don't go into presenter mode. Yeah, don't go into presenter. See if that helps. I think it's only affecting people on the phone because if you're on the desktop, I can see everything just fine. Okay. Agreed. Yep, same. Yeah, so ah, better. Go and do okay. uh, viewer mode. Okay. You know how you do the Yep, thumbnail. exactly. Hang on. Navigator. Navigator. Like that. Okay. Does that help everybody? And then maybe hide your- Much better. Your thing on the side there. I don't know if you can hide that. Hide um, my thing on the side. <laughs> okay. the Hang on. Now you just got way too technical for I me. Know, I know. There's a bar on the side. I can't remember. I that. don't know how to get rid of that in Keynote. Uh, uh, well, I don't even know. Bob, do you know? Uh, he, she should be able to push play now, Kirk. <laughs> yeah, she should just be able to push play up on top. Maybe. I don't think you can get rid of that in presenter mode. Yeah. yeah. Just, let's go with this. Is this I'm okay? just going to leave it like this if everybody can see. So, Everyone okay. Can, yes, 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 yes. Oh, thank God. Okay, because of listening, watching all the chats was really like, like I was going, I'm having trouble talking, and that's never an issue. I'm doing fabulous. <laughs> okay. So we were talking about the concept of pre-wedging. And so we all learned this to, to, as something we did in dental school and probably stopped. But when I was reading the research, here's what caught my attention. What caught my attention is that it actually takes a wedge somewhere on average between three to five minutes to push the teeth, compress the periodontal ligaments, and create a big enough space between the two teeth to overcome the actual thickness of a matrix band. And when I read those, you know, I didn't actually believe it. I thought one study, I looked at two, three, four, five. Eventually, they all had the same graph in them. And then I started to do the mental math of how long is my wedge in place before I fill? And even really exaggerating how slow I was at etching and rinsing and adhesive, there was no way I was getting to three minutes. So I decided to start playing with it. This is about 10 years ago in my clinical practice. And I will tell you from that day to this day, I pre-wedge every tooth that I do an interproximal restoration on. And I can't think of the last time that I had a missing contact or a light contact. As a matter of fact, I actually had to put hemostats on my um, composite setups in order to grab the sectional matrix bands out because you can't pull them out anymore with a cotton plier. So this is one of my favorite little tips and tricks. It also, by the way, does two other things. Now, I know for a fact that not a single one of the approximately 1,700 dentists who are listening to this right now have ever actually nicked an adjacent tooth. But for all those dentists not listening who maybe have had that happen, (laughs) okay, if the teeth are actually physically not touching, it makes nicking an adjacent tooth a little bit, you know, less likely to happen. But here's the other thing I learned about myself. I know for a fact from pre-wedging that I prepped the papilla every single time I prepped a class two. And I know that because now I prep the wedge every single time I prep a class two. So one of the great things about pre-wedging is you have a whole lot less hemorrhage and bleeding and problems when you go to fill because the wedge is protecting the tissue. Now, you are going to have to put two wedges out on every tray table because you're going to need to take the one that you cut during preparation and throw it away and put a brand new one in when you go to fill the tooth. Now, I will tell you, I took this picture. This is not a trick. I put this wedge in. This picture was taken exactly three minutes after I put the wedge in and these teeth snapped to floss before I put the wedge in. And you can actually see there's a visual space there which is the space that now your matrix band is going to take up. So I get my patients numb once anesthesia is on board. Very first thing I do is I push the wedge in and then I start to prep the tooth. Now, by the way, how, what's the right size wedge to use? Well, the correct size wedge is exactly like you see in the picture. It's equidistant, buccal and lingual. So you should have the same amount of wedge out both sides of the tooth. If the wedge is There's more of the wedge on the side you inserted from. The wedge is too big. You can't get it all the way through the contact. If you've got more of the wedge on the opposing side from where you inserted, it's too small. And where should you insert the wedge from? You should actually always insert the wedge from the side with the larger gingival embrasure, not the side that's most convenient. 
So I'm a right-handed dentist, which means I insert wedges from the buckle on the right side of the arch and I'm from the lingual on the left-hand side of the arch. That's actually not how they're designed to work. You're supposed to look and see which one's the bigger gingival embrasure, and that's the side that you put the wedge in from. Now, I'm, as a caveat, when you first start to pre-wedge, after you're done with the prep and you take the wedge out to put the sectional band in, you may see a little bleeding because you've compressed the papilla, but it's not cut, and as soon as you put the new wedge back in, it'll go away. You won't even need to use retraction paste. So for me, pre-wedging is something that's an old-timey technique that is absolutely one of the easiest ways to predictably have nice, tight contacts every time you do a class two and minimize the challenges with isolation. Hey, Lee. Go for it, Darren. There's some questions about the wedging uh, and with the different types of wedging systems. Uh, I guess some questions are, what do you like? And, and I'll, I'll say, and I probably heard you say this at one time, that you pre-wedge with a stiffer, like either the one you just showed or a wooden wedge. And then when you do your second wedge with the matrix in, you might tend to use more of the, like the garrison one with the little fins or the something. Little fin, yeah, the little fuzzes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the truth of it is if you have a wedge that you like um, for when you're placing composites, keep using that wedge. For pre-wedging, the ones with the little fingers and the feathers don't work because you're going to prep those off and it just gets messy. A nice, big, rigid, solid wedge is the best. And I will actually tell you, Darren, I only use the plastic ones now because I have done this with a wooden one. And when you prep the wood, every once in a while, you'll have a patient who ends up with a little splinter in a papilla. Ask me how I know that. Um, so I don't do that anymore. I only use the plastic ones when I pre-wedge because you actually are prepping it. So, and that that's reasonably new learning, okay? The other thing to just think about is you also may have to go up a size and wedge when you go to the second wedge that you place after the band is in, because you've moved the teeth enough that that first size wedge is now sloppy loose. And so that, that happens periodically as well, okay? All right, so let's talk a little bit more just on matrix systems. So sectional systems, um, rings, there's so many out there. I'm really clear there's no perfect matrix system because there are 50 booths in every exhibit floor from dentists who have invented matrix systems. So we keep inventing them because we don't have the perfect one. So when we think about a matrix system, each piece has a job. So the purpose of the band is to recreate the shape of the tooth you've prepped away. The purpose of the wedge is to seal the band against the gingival floor of a class two box and to separate the teeth and overcome the thickness of the matrix band. And the purpose of a ring in a ring system is to seal the band against the buckle and the lingual wall of the tooth preparation so you don't get flash. So every piece of the system has a purpose. Sectional matrix systems work really, really well as long as the buckle and the lingual walls of your box don't go past the line angle. As soon as you prep past the line angle, when you put the ring on, it pushes the band into the box and you get a contact, but then you get what looks like ribbon candy to the buckle and the lingual. The whole purpose of a sectional band was designed with composites. We didn't care about it with amalgam because all you'd have to do to trim the buckle and lingual was put an amalgam carver in that buckle space or lingual space, drag it up, Easy peasy, super, super simple to get that trim. But with composite, you have to do it with a hand piece. But if your line angles are, if the prep is past the line angles, it's not hard to get a hand piece there. So I don't worry so much about the buckle and lingual. Sectional matrices all day long, if you've actually got um, a nice prep that's contained within the line angles. After that, I typically go to either a more traditional Toffelmeyer style or you, what you see in the slide is something called a real matrix so that you can get those tighter. So you can use choose whatever wedge or, or matrix system you want once you get to those larger preps, okay? So how about clear matrix systems versus metal? So obviously mylar strips and the clear cure through matrix bands were designed so that you can get light curing through the matrix system. That's really interesting when I think about a class two in the posterior because I think almost every dentist I know would actually put the curing light on the occlusal of this preparation. So you're not trying to cure through the band anyway. 
And one of the things, if you do go look at the research about light curing and depth of cure, we actually get greater polymerization rates, greater depth of cure in a class two box when we're using a shiny metal matrix band because you're actually able to refract the light off the internal of a shiny band and shorten the distance from the source to the material polymerizing. So in my practice, I actually use the shiny metal sectional matrix bands when I'm actually doing um, the posterior composites. And I do use cure through when I'm doing anything in the anterior. How about side-by-side -side preps? Anybody just really loves side-by-side -side preps because they're so fun and so easy to do, right? It's my fave thing. Um, and I've tried everything. I've tried um, prep one tooth, fill it, then prep the other. That irritates me when I nick my own brand new composite, right? I've tried um, fill one and then fill the other, but they're prepped simultaneously. That never works. Your matrix band causes a contact that looks like a triangle. I, for years, I did this side-by-side -side bands, except you can only fill one composite. So you put two bands in, one wedge, one ring, fill one tooth. Take everything apart, trim that composite. Now put one band, one wedge, one ring back on and do the second one. Because you needed the second band in order to hold the first band to give you that shape. I've tried bite registration paste, you name it. I've tried to think of every creative thing. Okay? The challenge is that you actually need something to hold the first band into the right shape so that you don't get material going through there. And we're gonna talk about the use of Teflon tape as a way to manage this. And so hang on for one or two slides and I'm gonna show you how I use Teflon tape. I actually use Teflon tape for lots of things. Someone should write a book like a thousand uses for Teflon tape in dentistry. Um, and, but don't, because then you won't be able to buy it at Home Depot and they'll charge us a lot for it. So keep it, keep it under your hat, okay? Here's the other thing I use Teflon tape for. Once I put a matrix band in place, I got the band, the wedge, and the ring in place. I stop and I look down in the prep. Any place that band is not intimately in contact with the prep, you're gonna get extrusion of material. And I don't care how you fill with what density of composite, you're gonna get extrusion of material here. So you could do a couple things. You could take the ring off and reverse the wedge. Maybe I put the wedge in from the wrong side. Um, you could try a bigger wedge, um, you know, but I'm gonna tell you in my world, this is the perfect place for Teflon tape because I don't know about anybody else, but I get cold chills thinking about trying to trim that little tiny fin of composite. By the way, that's the distal lingual of a lower first molar. Fun place to get a mosquito diamond in a hand piece. So we're gonna do that with Teflon tape. So I think everybody probably should be able to see my mouse, my, my cursor from my mouse. And so I want you to look at this little triangle outside the band, but mesial to the adjacent unprepped tooth and confined by the ring. So there's a little triangle right here. And so the way you're gonna fix this is you're gonna take Teflon tape and you're gonna tuck the tail right into this triangle. And now you're gonna take the end of a perio probe and you're just gonna push the Teflon tape all the way gingively, like condensing it gingively until you see the band literally go bloop, bloop, bloop and touch the tooth. And so the Teflon tape goes outside the band. This is just a whole bunch of excess Teflon tape. It's just been packed right there into that triangle. So, I'm going to try to play a video, which means I'm going to have to go into play mode on my computer for a second. And so I know those of you watching on an iPad or a tablet are probably going to watch this and need your loops to see it. Um, but so that everybody can kind of see this, hopefully it will stream and then I'll go back to this mode. Okay. So this is a video that I did with a set of high def loops on my uh, a high def camera on my loop. So see what happens when you have two preps and one band. So I'm going to take the ring off and then I'm just going to literally take Teflon tape and I'm going to condense the Teflon tape into the prep I'm not going to fill. And so you'll see here I'm doing with cotton pliers just to place it, but then I actually am going to condense it. So one of the gifts of Teflon tape is it is condensable. It gets really, really firm and rigid. 
And you need it to be tight enough in that box that you can actually condense composite in the other tooth against it. Why use Teflon tape for this versus wax or silicone? Because the Teflon tape doesn't contaminate or dirty the adjacent prep at all. There's nothing to clean up when you're done. You literally just pull it out with a cotton plier and you're ready to go. And so once I've got my Teflon tape in there, I'm going to put my ring back on. And then we're going to see, I'll pick up a mirror so you can see that what the Teflon tape has done is two things. It's given me the right shape to my contact and it's given me a firm surface that I can condense against. So this is my all time favorite for side by side preps and for places where matrix bands don't fit exactly against the shape of the tooth. So I'm going to go back here and exit again, just so that we don't lose all the people on iPad and we'll go back to this, uh, this format. Okay. All right. So we're going to leave matrix bands behind. And now let's talk about prep scrubs desensitizers. So this is a pretty confusing area of materials because some manufacturers call these prep scrubs. Some manufacturers call these desensitizers. We have some manufacturers call these rewetting agents. They're all the same group of materials. There are only three active ingredients in this group of materials, 2% chlorhexidine, 2 to 5% glutaraldehyde, and HEMA. And so 2% chlorhexidine and 2 to 5% glutaraldehyde are interchangeable. They both do the same three things. They're antimicrobial, so they kill off the bacteria in the dental tubules. That helps prevent sensitivity from a reversible pulpitis. It also reduces the instance of an irreversible pulpitis and need for endo. Both chlorhexidine and glutaraldehyde are rewetting agents. So if you are total etching, it re-moistens the dentin, opens the dental tubules, allows for your primer to chase down into the dental tubules for maximum hybrid zone. And both chlorhexidine and glutaraldehyde prevent the production of MMPs, matrix metal proteinases, which are largely responsible for the bond degradation over time to dentin. What does that mean? It means it'll increase the longevity of your adhesively placed restorations. HEMA is the second ingredient that is only combined with glutaraldehyde. It's the desensitizer. So HEMA actually goes down into the dental tubules, causes a little co coagulative collagen, prevents fluid movement called hydrostatic sensitivity and prevents post-op sensitivity. So you're either going to use 2% chlorhexidine. So that's Concepsis from Ultradent. Here's a note if you want to use chlorhexidine. Do not dilute mouthwash. You cannot dilute Peridex, PerioGuard, PerioStat. Anything sold as a chlorhexidine-based mouthwash also has glycerin, flavorings, other ingredients that could impede bonding. You need to buy a pure 2% chlorhexidine prep scrub. Or what I do is I buy a gallon jug of 2% chlorhexidine that's sold to irrigate endodontic preparations, pull it up in my own syringes and use it that way. Alternatively, you're going to use a product that is glutaraldehyde and HEMA combined together. I personally use Gluma from Colzer, um, but you can also use Telio CS from Ivoclar Vivident or Microprime G. Make sure you're getting Microprime G um, from Danville. So there's alternative products on the market for that, okay? Um, somebody posted in the chat, does Gluma replace the need for a liner in a deep cavity? And the answer is no. So glutaraldehyde is not a pulp capping material. Um, and so if I have really super deep decay, I do place a indirect pulp cap. I personally use Theracal from Bisco. So it is a resin modified MTA, mineral trioxide aggregate. It basically leaches calcium hydroxide. And then I will put my Gluma on top of it. Um, you can also use glass ionomer. Glass ionomers are phenomenal pulp capping or lining materials, but they're not interchangeable with glutaraldehyde type products. Okay? So I put a prep scrub on every tooth I prep, indirect, direct, um, and I actually am OCD enough that when I'm bonding in indirect restorations like veneers, I clean the prep with concepsis or chlorhexidine, and then I also apply Gluma as part of the adhesive process. Okay. 
Um, and so, you, you know, from a standpoint of sensitivity, remember, um, these don't just prevent sensitivity. They re-wet so that they increase your dentin adhesion. They're antimicrobial, so they, um, they prevent reversible and irreversible pulpitis or minimize it. But most importantly, why to add these to your posterior composites or your indirect restorations? Reducing the production of MMPs, increasing the longevity of the restoration in the oral environment. Um, so where do you apply these? Right before the dentin adhesive. I don't care which system you use, total etch, hybrid etch, self etch, these go down right before the first step of your dentin adhesive. So if you total etch, etch, rinse, dry, apply these, then move to your adhesive. If you're self etching, apply these and then move to your adhesive, okay? And um, there's lots and lots of good science about how these work. They do not increase bond strength. They do not decrease bond strength. And I'll refer you to the study that was done by Harold Hyman and Ed Swift at UNC. Um, Mark is like, yep. <laughs> right. Um, and what they did is they looked at the use of this category of materials with, I think it was nine or 10 different dent adhesives. And they compared the bond strengths with and without it doesn't affect bond strengths. It minimizes the production of MMPs. I will tell you, because somebody asked about directions, I do not use Gluma following the manufacturer's directions. So if you're listening and you work for Colzer, please put your fingers in your ears right now, okay? I use these the way that Harold Hyman and Ed Swift use them in the study. So I apply Gluma with a micro brush and then I blot it dry with a cotton pellet and I leave it on the tooth. I do not apply for 60 seconds, rinse and dry, do a second application, rinse and dry. Put it on the tooth with a micro brush, just on the dentin. Don't be sloppy, just put it right on the dentin and then just blot it dry so that you've got rid of the excess, okay? Um, so anything in this category, when, whether you, if you prefer chlorhexidine, great. If you prefer glueraldehyde, great. Um, they basically ostensibly do the same things. Okay. All right. Somebody asked about um, universal adhesives and here we go. So eighth generation dentin adhesives, this is the newest iteration of dentin adhesives. And pretty much every company on the planet now has something they call a universal adhesive. First, you need to understand what the manufacturer of the adhesive you're using means by the word universal. They do not all have it mean interchangeably. What does this category mean you can do? First, it means you can use any etching technique and use the same adhesive. So that's great for inventory control. You can self-etch, you can total etch, you can hybrid etch, you can selective etch, any of those four etching protocols use one adhesive. Some of these adhesives have something that's called a dual cure activator or a DCA, and you can add a drop and you can turn these into dual cure adhesives. Others do not, they're purely light cured. What is the magic behind this category? It's the fact that the monomer science in universals is a chemistry called MDP. And MDP for a lot, a lot of years was actually patented by Curari. And when their patent expired, it allowed the other manufacturers to put it into their dentin adhesives. MDP's pH is perfect to allow you to total etch and use it without over etching, or it'll etch on its own and you can self etch. The other thing that's phenomenal about MDP is it is a universal primer. It primes dentin, enamel, metal, composite, glass ceramics, and zirconia. In addition, MDP is much lower technique sensitivity because of its moisture tolerance. So MDP is a more hydrophilic monomer, so it's moisture tolerant until it's polymerized. And once you light cure it, it becomes hydrophobic, so it tends to repel water. So MDP, the chemistry of MDP, actually does really advance adhesive technology. And so I'm a big fan of anything in the, use, in the universal category. 
And again, I promise whatever manufacturer you're using has an adhesive in the universal category. So look at these if you're not using them. Um, I, I will tell you the only place that I will tell you be cautious about mix and ma mixing and matching between manufacturers is when you're placing indirect restorations. We're having, we're having a conversation about direct adhesives, direct bonding, mix and match across manufacturers all you want as long as everything is light cured, okay? And as soon as you get to placing veneers, bonding and inlays or onlays, buy a kit, use a kit. Because none of the manufacturers test their materials with other people's materials and you don't wanna risk incompatibilities as soon as you go to any of those systems. Okay, um, I did see in the chat box the question about Scotch Bond and Gluma. So here's what I will tell you: um, I'm not aware of any science that shows any challenges between Gluma or any other glutaraldehyde and HEMA-containing desensitizers and any dent adhesive on the market. And so, and I've I've heard that before, um, but I've not yet seen any science to support that. And the one body of literature we do have actually comes, again, from Harold Hyman um, and Ed Swift. And or you can go to CR, Gordon Christensen. And he has some really good stuff on CR about using Gluma and how it works with adhesives, if you have more questions about that. So next, um, kind of something new, is let's talk about the two new kinds of composites on the market today. And those are bulk fills we'll do next, but let's talk about injectables. Okay? And so when we think about this material, this is not a flowable. And so GC America brought Genial Injectable to the market at Chicago, no, maybe Chicago Midwinter last year, maybe like 2019. I'm old enough I lose track of time now. I can't keep track of all of this stuff. Um, but it's not a flowable, which is why they named it injectable. In general terms, we can typically um, understand the filler content of a composite based on its viscosity. So the thicker a composite, the higher its filler content, and the thinner or the le le less viscous a composite, the lower its filler particles. Why do you care about that? Because the higher the filler percentage, the better the physical properties of a composite-based material. The challenge is that that usual way we look at it has gotten more complicated lately. And so we now have high filler percentage flowables, and those are very different than the old school traditional flowables. And now we have Genial Injectable. So Genial Injectable comes in a syringe, it feels like a flowable, but it has a high enough filler percentage that it can be used in replace of any traditional composite that you normally get in a syringe or would put in a composite gun. So you get the handling properties of a more flowable material with the physical properties of a high filler content material. They do make it in a regular two millimeter depth of cure material and then in a bulk fill, um, higher four to five millimeter depth of cure. I will tell you that I've been using this material in my in my practice since it came on the market. Here's where I love it. I love it for class fives. It's such an easy, gorgeous material to use for a class five. I see Darren Becker smiling, so I don't know if he's agreeing with me or disagreeing with me, okay? Um, agreeing with me? But it's a very pretty material, very aesthetic and awesome for class fives. Um, the other place I use it is really small class one restorations and so you've got that it's not it doesn't quite qualify for a sealant you've got to do a little prep but so you do need to fill it this is a gorgeous material for that and I will also tell you I have started using it just recently as the labial enamel layer in some of my anterior composite restorations it is really gorgeous and really easy to apply from handling properties okay so something you just might want to play with and again Called the, it, both of them are called genial injectable. One's bulk, one's universal. So now let's talk about bulk fill composites. And I will tell you when they first brought bulk fill composites to the market, I was a little irritated. And I was a little irritated because the manufacturers had spent 20 years beating me across the head, you know, one millimeter layers, do angled layers, I mean, all of this stuff because of C factor and shrinkage 
And, you know, we'd, we'd basically just been inundated with the fact that smaller layers, you know, make sure you polymerize every layer. And then all of a sudden they come out and say, okay, now you can bulk fill. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. You just spent two decades teaching me not to do this. And now you're trying to sell me a material that does this. Well, how did that happen? So if you go back and you look at the science, there's really good science behind bulk fill composites. As a matter of fact, the material science that allowed manufacturers to sell bulk fills has actually improved traditional composites. So even the composites you're using today where you're still layering are actually better today. They have better science behind them because of the technology that went into developing a way to do bulk fill. Again, you need to know what bulk fill you're using. They are not all created equal. Some have a four millimeter depth of cure. Some go up to a six millimeter depth of cure. Some require a cap layer. So you can use them up to the top one to two millimeters on the occlusal, but then you have to put a different composite that has a higher filler percentage, better physical properties at the top one to two millimeters. Other bulk fills can go right all the way up to the occlusal table and do not require a cap layer. Some bulk fills come in a syringe like a flowable. Some bulk fills come in a traditional compule or a syringe. Some require their own special hand piece. So you've got lots of different ways they use them. How does the whole field work? The whole field works because what the manufacturers figured out how to do was to reduce something we call polymerization shrinkage. They did such a great job that we don't even use that term anymore. We actually use the term shrinkage stress. So instead of the bulk of composite all shrinking toward its center of mass when you light cure it, they somehow figured out how to control the direction of the shrinkage so it's not pulling on the dent adhesive. And if it doesn't pull on the dent adhesive, it doesn't stress the bonded interface, then it doesn't decrease the longevity of the restoration. That was the primary science behind bulk fill was managing shrinkage stress. Second, they needed to increase depth of cure. They did that two ways. They invented new photo initiators that were more powerful. And two, they made the materials more translucent so you get more light going through all the way to the depth of the restoration. Now there's a compromise. They're not quite as pretty as non-bulk fill composites, but on the occlusal of number 15, not sure that that's a deal breaker. If you can get done faster, it's less troublesome for isolation and you have a more predictable restoration. And it also makes dentistry more efficient without compromising sort of the technical excellence. So absolutely bulk fills. So my standard class two protocol is I use a bulk fill composite from the floor of the box all the way up to that top two millimeter layer. And then I use a cap layer of material in my practice. That's my personal preference. And by the way, I'm a big fan of composites that are radio opaque. We have a real issue in dentistry because of radiolucent materials for the last decade. And so I like more radio opaque composites versus more radiolucent. That's a personal preference. I want to be able to see them on an x-ray. All right. I think we have time for one more slide and then we'll maybe do Q&A. And I do just want to talk about composite warmers. If you've not ever used a composite warmer, um, it will transform your life. It'll be the best couple hundred bucks you've ever spent, and that's about all they're worth is a couple hundred bucks. I use a CalSet composite warmer, and I buy it from a company called A-Dent. So the black piece that you see down here with the red and yellow button is the warmer, and it gets plugged into a wall. What's in the top is an insert, and you can buy a couple different inserts, and you can choose the one you want. If you only use syringes, do this one. Um, if you like the little compules that go in a composite gun, do this one. And you plug it in, it stays at exactly the same temperature all day long. Here's how it works. All composite gets more liquid when it's been brought to a specific temperature. 
it makes the handling properties more ideal, but it doesn't change the physical properties and it returns right back to its normal viscosity as soon as it cools back to room temperature. And so if you like the ability to inject a composite, have it flow really nicely, but you wanna use a high filler percentage composite, composite warming is the way to do it. And I use one in my practice. It's plugged in in every operatory, turned on in the morning when my assistants turn on the operatory, and it stays in there all day long. Um, if you need to switch colors, they warm up pretty darn quickly. Just do your shade at the beginning so your assistant can load the right colors. And by the way, studies have shown when you use warm composite, um, you get better adhesive bonds, you get better marginal adaptation. It actually improves several pieces of a composite because it makes the technique easier. All right, so I think we're gonna stop here. It's, uh, I think we're seven minutes to the hour. Um, and so you guys can maybe fill me in on all the questions that my chat box keeps seeing pop in. Um, I just want to say one thing. I okay. told you she was amazing. Like she's amazing. She's amazing. I told you so. She is amazing. And I got a little secret for you. We were working behind the scenes, and she said, "I I asked her. I go, Lee, you're amazing. Can you help us with a panky day?" She goes, "Oh, I'd love that. So we are actually going to do a full panky day, and we'll make that announcement after this. But Darren, you want to ask questions? And Mark, you want to ask questions? Yeah, Lee. Thank Quick you. question about cross contamination. With yeah. those with those composite warmers. Right. So I mean, I will tell you, I use the little, I don't know if you want to call them PLTs or compules or cavi fills, you know, every manufacturer has a name. Um, I actually personally um don't reuse those between patients. So if I only use part of a cavi fill, we throw it out. And so we only ever keep fresh ones in the composite warmer. Um, if you reuse those my guess is that you have a you have a protocol for wiping them down with cavicide or one minute wipes um, because you also have to put them back into a tray setup or a drawer or someplace. So whatever you're doing to disinfect them before you put them back someplace else would also keep you from contaminating your composite warmer. No chances that our colleagues are cheap and would reuse them, but just I just I, I don't make any assumptions about that. I have places where I'm frugal as well. I told you I won't buy the chlorhexidine from Ultradent. I pull my own 2% up. So that's a place I'm frugal, right? That's just a brilliant smart. lecture. Thank you, Mark. Uh, there were some questions about which of the, the um, I guess, the both the bulk fill and the, and the capping uh, composites that you find are best that have the, the high rad radio opacity as well. So, you know, I always hate to quote brands simply because I will tell you that there are no bad brands of materials on the market. Um, I've used almost everything out there and it all works. And really, you need to choose the material that you like because you happen to like its handling properties, its specific way that it works in your protocol. So um, I, I, will, I will tell you personally that I happen to use Ivoclar's Tetric bulk flowable as the base. Um, and I do use it for a couple reasons. It's very high radio opacity. It's self leveling. So it has high thixotropic properties, is the way we say that. Um, and, um, and then I actually do cap with a GC America composite called Genial Sculpt. Okay. So, but I have lots, I mean, I've, I've tried all the different materials and they're all good. So don't switch to what I'm using, right? There's, there, your manufacturer you work with has a material that works just as well. And any tips for uh, minimizing the risk of having the dreaded white line uh, occur? So the white line is excessive polymerization shrinkage and that, and it occurs more often with a class one than any other preparation style. And that is, if you are getting the white line, um, you are either curing too big a bulk of composite or you are curing it too rapidly and it's shrinking so much that it's fracturing the enamel rods. That's what the white line is, is actual fractured enamel at the interface. Exactly. Okay. Awesome. Any other Very good. Lots so a couple things. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Do you have another question you want to ask, Darren? Go ahead and ask one more. Well, there was another question. I just wanted to say, uh, Lee, thank you so much for your time and your 
expertise, the, the, the feedback, I'm sure you're seeing it is just amazing. And uh, a much needed uh, break from the monotony of, of uh, not being able to go to work. I got up this morning and I got dressed and Amanda said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to work. <laughs> exactly. Patient? I'm like, no, I'm going to work. I need this. Yeah. We always joked, um, you know, off the side, like, wouldn't it be great? I love CE so much. What if I had a job where I just CE'd all day? And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like this weird nightmare is turning into a little bit of a dream. But here, I want to say this. Uh, you've already got a sample of how powerful and awesome this woman is. And she leads an incredible organization called the Panky Institute. And Darren, you'll appreciate this. One of my first experiences in dentistry was sitting and through something called the C1, where Erwin Becker was my instructor along with Clayton Davis, and it truly changed my life. And so, you know, if you haven't heard of it, you need to hear about it. So I want you to do two things. Number one, write this day down. So Lee has said, yeah, absolutely. She's going to put together five unbelievable educators, or at least five hours of educators. Next Friday, mark your calendar, the 10th, we're going to do a panky day. And okay. you're going to get you're going to get blessed by some incredible thinkers. It is truly a special day. Just mark it off. Um, and then I got a lot of requests for your anterior. Was it your anterior composite? Well, I was just going to say, I think I know what I'll do next Friday is I guess we'll <laughs> pick up the conversation and we'll do more composites. We'll just switch to the anterior. That sounds good. And then also, Lee, I know you guys are stepping up and really offering a great relief package via the Panky Institute. I mean, if, if you have anything right now, or we can add it, is there, you know, if people want to get involved with the Panky Institute in this time, what can, what can they do right now watching? Like where, where can they go? Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's actually several things I will recommend. Um, you know, if you like to read, go to our Panky Graham website. So pankygram.org, P-A-N-K-E-Y-G-R-A-M.org. And lots and lots of great articles from all of our 70-some faculty. Um, I, I don't want to compete with you guys, but we are offering our own webinars just Monday, Wednesday, Friday. There's um, no competition. We're all helping the industry. Right? Um, yeah. but, and that one's easy. It's pankygram.org slash webinars. Um, and so like I'm doing, um, Sam Lau is doing one later today. I'm doing one on Wednesday on assessing functional risk, but you can find them all there. We just do an hour three times a week. Um, and then, of course, um, one, you know, once we're back and we're operational and we're um, holding classes again, um, we are allowing people right now to register for classes in the future. And we've kind of waived our um, initial deposit requirements. So people can simply say, hey, I want to come. I want to put this date on my calendar. But obviously, right now, we're all trying to um, watch our dollars and cents. Um, and so, yeah, we, if you're interested, we're still answering the phone um, or you can go to panky.org. That's our main website. Don't hesitate. Don't think about it. Just do it. It's never begrudge your investment. Um, Darren, you've been to the Panky Institute and Mark, you've been there. Is it a, is it a place time. that changes your life or well, not? Inside of dentistry, it's the most important thing I ever did. And uh, met like-minded people. And it's just not the same as online learning, which has been unbelievable during these turbulent times. But the classes themselves are amazing. And then the learning with your classmates at night, when you go to dinner and you sit around and talk and look at cases and find out you're not the only person who has problems. That was my favorite uh, part, it, was the nighttime. The single most important thing I did for my continuing education in 32 years of private practice. I'll, I'll, I'll ditto that. Um, having grown up basically there and... Uh, going through all the courses uh, when I was starting out in practice as an associate. Uh, it, you know, the technical piece was incredible, especially as a young sponge of a, of a dentist, but it's the, the rest of the story of how to incorporate it into my practice and how do I talk to my team and how do I talk to my patients about it and how do I do it in a way where I can be financially successful and uh, all of that part of it. And like Mark said, just the, the kindred spirit piece of being around like-minded people who are trying to do the best for their patients and their practice uh, and, and hearing and sharing all those ideas is just uh, un, unparalleled anywhere. And I've studied everywhere. So yeah, it's the best. Lee, you and the Institute are a blessing. Thank you. Oh, so thank much. you. You guys too. Thanks for doing this and keep up the good work, you guys. Yeah, absolutely. I'll see you next Friday. Mark, Mark your calendars next Thanks. Friday. Thanks.